One. Hey, welcome to Marshall's Mississippi Zoom Tour. I'm Marshall Ramsey, editor-at-large at Mississippi Today. I'm really glad to have our guest on today, somebody that I've actually gotten to know through the power of Facebook. And I know before you're, you're probably looking at me right now going, Marshall, I don't know. There's a lot of people on Facebook I don't really want to know, or I know, and I don't want to know them. But Dr. Jennifer Bryan is um, a very good communicator on all things COVID and all things that are going on in medical in Mississippi. And I wanted to have her on today. And we're going to tell a little bit, get her to tell us a little bit about her, but have her try to walk us through the next six months or so as the vaccine starts coming into play, as you know, we start having some of the challenges that we're having right now with COVID. And so I wanted to get her on. She was, of course, the first female elected as the chair of Mississippi State Medical Association's Board of Trustees, which after 150 years, that's pretty darn impressive. She moves, uh, moves medicine, I like that term, by educating lawmakers on global issues that affect medicine and emphasizing the importance of patient communication. She's also a mom and, of course, a family physician in Flowood, Mississippi. And if I can say physician, uh, then we might just get through this interview. I don't know. But anyway, Jennifer, thanks for taking the time and talking to us today. Uh, I know you're incredibly busy and I don't want you keeping your patients in the lobby reading too many old magazines. That would be bad on my part. But thanks for taking the time today. Yeah, no, thanks for having me. I really appreciate that. And like you have enjoyed getting to know you over the, the past year or so um, with our, our public personas. You and I actually met one time over um, and there was, a I think, a Chamber of Commerce thing in, um, in Rankin County. And uh, I was so impressed there. Um, you were there with some of your media colleagues and we got to chat. And, um, and so I really enjoyed developing this relationship with you. And and have appreciated your leadership. You know your your talent through um, expressing feelings and and current events through art has certainly helped keep Mississippians afloat, um, in touch, and also many times has been just the the positive boost that we needed in some pretty dark times. So thanks again. Oh, you're welcome. And that's one of the things I like about you is because not only are you a physician, but you also really believe in patient communication. And that, I think, in 2020 is something that we need not only on an individual level, but I think on a global scale, because we're fighting so much misinformation with what's been going on and with the pandemic. And it's it's that, like I said, I, I really got to know you a little bit through your Facebook persona, but I mean, you you are very good. There's a couple of doctors. There's Dustin Gentry, who's up in uh, wine, up in Louisville. Yeah, he's wonderful. He's fantastic. He's really been calming for his community too. But I, I just wanted to get you on today and talk a little bit, A, about you and your career and what got you interested in medicine, how you're holding up through the pandemic. And then we'll kind of walk through the next six months because as the, the vaccine comes online, Obviously, we're looking at maybe next summer when things can get back to normal, I'll mm -hmm. do the finger right. quotes. But, yeah. you know, we got a lot of things that we need to do between now and then. So I, let's let's just go ahead and get started. Yeah, sure. Um, where do you want to start? Um, kind okay, of how we got, I got you into, into medicine. medicine. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you know, when I was when I was young, my uncle, um, Dr. Tom Joyner, he practiced in Jackson for many years. Um, just kind of gave me a job in his office and I came along and in the summers I would work there in a private practice and I really enjoyed what I saw. It was um, an era where there was a lot less regulation than there is now, um, but I enjoyed it. I enjoyed what it was to be the town doctor and the community physician. He also was really involved in um, pol health policy and is a past president of the State Medical Association and gave me the best piece of advice, which was to just keep showing up. Uh, and, and things would come to you. And so I did. And also to keep doing the next right thing. And I took that to heart. My, my dad is an attorney. Um, he's the um, retired, but he was the federal public defender for Mississippi and did that for 17 years. And um, those two are brothers. And so I kind of had a good foundation coming along and understanding the law and our governance, but also the compassion involved with um, being a physician. I, I, I really never other than me want to be a rock star when I was about five really <laughs> didn't have, have many other ideas um, besides being a doctor and so I, I set that course early on when I uh, graduated from Brandon High School went on to Mississippi State majored in microbiology and actually was organizing some things and ran across some of those classes on an old transcript this week it was really fascinating some pathogenic microbiology and virology and immunology you know, just learned a lot there about some of the things that we are uh, facing. And then came back to UMC and um, did medical school here and just really fell in love with family medicine. Tried to have an open mind, but went back to my roots. 
which is what I had always known. And, um, and then alongside that developed a love of health policy. And in fact, we did an elective, my last year of residency at UMC, which was designated to that, spent some time in Washington and um, just, just gaining experience. And then went back to my hometown of Brandon and started practicing. And eventually I've drifted over towards Flowood, which is where we're raising our kids over on this side of Rankin County now. But um, yeah, I mean, the love of medicine, I think I've, I've always enjoyed communicating. I've always enjoyed people. And I don't know, it's just something about being, being the doctor that can break things down and real speak to someone and explain a really serious condition and walk them through it and be that person that has always fed my soul a little. And on a popu population health perspective with the pandemic, I think that's what drew me into social media even more was to want to explain what seemed so nebulous, if that makes sense. I saw a great exchange today on, on uh, my Facebook page. Somebody uh, was calling somebody, you know, a sheep and, a, you know, basically like that. And this person that they were calling a sheep about the virus actually is a researcher for the vaccine. So oh, yeah. Like, oh, yeah. It's like, so, oh. but I mean, that's, that's, that's the problem is that right now th there are people that are experts that do understand the virus, do understand the things that we need to do. And they're competing against the conspiracy of the day. How, as a doctor, and, and I can tell you, I've been on the other side of that doctor patient relationship when you get bad news. And a lot right. of times you're just sitting there and you hear Charlie Brown's parents, you know, mm -hmm. you hear want, 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 want cancer, as it was in my yes. case. You know, it's hard to take hard news like that. We're kind of in a situation right now where, you know, the hospitals are at record numbers from COVID patients. We're going into a time when everybody's going to be indoors. The vaccine's just now coming online and really won't be online for the average person until the spring. Right. How can we communicate to the population and actually get them to understand that if we don't do something, this could get really dire very quickly? You know, there's so much psychology to 2020 that, I mean, we could spend all day talking about the stages of grief. Uh, you know, we all have experienced grief in our life on an individual level where the shock uh, initially hits you and you think this can't be happening. Yeah. Um, and there's a denial, this is not happening. Um, and we rage about it sometimes, or we, we, uh, we cry, we feel sadness, but eventually there comes acceptance. And, you know, Politics aside, we all know that politics hijacked some of this narrative this year. I mean, it did, and it's an election year and, um, and conversations got really heated and polarized. But we, I think, I hope, are coming around to some collective acceptance as everybody is individually touched. And sure, as a physician, I wanted a proactive message out there, a prevention medicine message, you know, like um, exercise and eat healthy so you don't deal with these other medical problems. Go on and wear a mask, social distance and hand wash, live your life, let's contact, test, track and isolate and get through this thing. But we are more reactive as a society and as a government. And that is what it is. And I had to accept some of that along the way because otherwise it would eat me alive to take it so personally why people could not do the things that I thought were common sense or that were tried and true public health measures. So you kind of meet people where they are and psychologically, people have, have processed a lot. This is a collective trauma that we're going through. It's, it's awful. It's a crisis, a real full-blown crisis. But we're going to get through it. So right now, we're in the worst of it. And, and we are, um, it's going to get worse. We know that because, unfortunately, as cases escalate, deaths follow. Now, some of that's been tempered by the fact of, boy, science has gotten better. We've gotten some tools. We've gotten better at managing people and keeping them out of the hospital and so on. But it's going to get worse before it gets better. But I believe that people are now beginning to understand that, um, well, just how serious it is because just by the sheer numbers, so many of us have been personally affected. And um, what can we expect going forward? Well, we've got the vaccine rolling um, in, in just a couple of um, a couple of weeks. We've got healthcare workers are going to be able to. Um, I'm sorry, my phone keeps going off here. Um, healthcare workers will get the vaccine, followed by you know 
I posted some stuff about it today from the American Medical Association, but which I thought was brilliant, by the way, that was really helpful. I really appreciate them putting that out there, that timeline of just breaking it down. So we don't have enough for everybody, but if we get this, you know, I think it's estimated in the 180 something thousand doses um, to Mississippi sometime in December. That's what I've heard thrown around. If we get that and we, we, we're going to interrupt significant transmission there just by vaccinating the healthcare workforce. And we understand if you picture a row of matches and the virus is burning along and then this match is vaccinated, it stops. So yeah. we understand that's going to blunt some. So I would imagine around the 1st of January or so, we're going to start to see some of these deaths kind of leveling off and, and the models are calling for some of that to start kind of coming back down, but it's going to be a slow, painful process. We will, we will continue to see, uh, we'll come online with more and more vaccine in the first quarter of next year. And I've seen where well into the late spring and early summer, the majority of the population is expected to be vaccinated. And, and they're working on the nuances of what population gets the vaccine when. But right now, I keep saying the world's on fire right now. This is the time to batten down the hatches. The next few weeks are gonna be critical. And that's hard because we're coming into Christmas when everybody wants to be together inside with family singing carols, enjoying eggnog. I mean, that's the tough thing. And that's, you know, we're going to pay for part of what happened during Thanksgiving, obviously, yeah. in the next couple of weeks, too. What I'm worried about, and I think this is you're really dialed in to what's what's going on in the medical community in Mississippi. What I'm worried about is it's great to have a ventilator, but if you don't have anybody that can actually run it, then that comes to be a problem. And I've talked to several nurses and a few doctors that are like incredibly burned out and they're frustrated because they see people on the news, they see things on their Facebook page where people are saying, oh, it's just the flu or whatever at this point, which I can't believe they're still saying that, you know, and everybody I've noticed kind of sees it through their own prism. If it hasn't touched their family or if they haven't had it, they still don't understand the potential seriousness of it. But what are we going to do? I mean, I understand, you know, obviously medical workers will get the vaccine first, long -ter long term care residents will get a second. That's the way it needs to be. But what can we do mentally to help our medical staff be able to survive the next six months? Because this that's like they've been in combat since March. Oh, it's awful. It's awful. Um, we're we're going to have a, a workforce riddled with PTSD by the time um, we get through all of this. And in fact, we're already seeing um, our professional health program is being utilized at levels that it has not been historic. And does a wonderful job there with keeping our physician healthy and, and practicing. Um, what can the public do? One thing, you know, pay attention to the doctor that you've listened to your whole life to tell you about that cancer diagnosis or your heart disease diagnosis. They're not gonna, they're not gonna leave you astray. We don't, we by and large generally are all on the same page. You're gonna get a person here or there that, that hollers about masks or hollers about some latest, greatest treatment, but really physicians communicate in real time all day long. I mean, we talk constantly in our groups and things and, there's just not a lot of controversy. Um, there's a lot of frustration there. Um, we've got a lot of physicians sick at home. So to the extent that the public can support these guys, you know, we got a lot of clapping at first. We got a lot of healthcare heroes work here and man, that's appreciated. But we also have a lot of burned out doctors. I've got a lot of doctors at home. Uh, just this morning, I heard from another one where she and her, her infant daughter are quarantined from COVID that they got you know, um, from work. And so that's another strain because when a doctor goes down, there's not another group over here of doctors ready to, to step up. Right. And these guys have been operating with um, minimal PPE. They are still at crisis level PPE. I'd say modified crisis. So it used to be you walked into a room with an N95 with one patient, you got through, you threw it away. Right. If you went back and saw them at three o'clock in the afternoon, you put on a new one and you threw it away. Now, some of that probably was excess and we're learning more about that. But in the meantime, we know these are finite resources. And so every day people are reusing things in a manner that it was not originally designed. They know that, they wanna do it, but that's a constant stress. And they're seeing people die and they're, they're, they're with people taking their last breaths and, and trying to relay this stuff to family members. And so I think, um, I saw today, actually someone called Dr. Woodward uh, on Twitter <laughs> that panic much, or, you know, kind of teasing her about it. And, uh, and I've certainly been, I, we've all been called and ridiculed 
uh, and laughed at uh, in, in, in different things. You get large appreciation, but you get the negativity. I, th I think the more that the public can support the people who are on the front lines just by listening, accepting what unfortunately is the, is the reality of what we're going through. And, and, um, and changing things ever so slightly. We, we talked this week about Christmas. We don't have to give up Christmas. We do need to figure out how to problem solve through it. And we need to figure out adaptability. And I firmly believe that adaptability is a, a human quality that just cannot be, uh, the importance cannot be underscored in the pandemic. You gotta figure out how you're gonna get through and not go crazy. And so, so the public needs to figure out how are we not gonna spike again after Christmas or how are we gonna blunt the Christmas impact? How are we not gonna do Thanksgiving again? We, there's gonna be a bump. I mean, we know there's gonna be because you can't get everybody on the same page. That's not gonna happen. So do you have a fire pit, a favorite fire pit outside? Can you, um, you know, figure out how to, to utilize Zoom? Can you postpone to February? Like we've done with family from out of state. You know, how, how can you logistically plan to not be normal in abnormal times, right? Oh, the good. I've been working on trying to be normal for 50 years. So I don't know. I <laughs> think I'm in trouble on that one. Listen to a very powerful uh, interview with Dr. Dobbs. He's talking about the, the hospitalizations now are actually at record levels. Um, right. we've, we've gone back up after we had the mask mandate and everything dropped and then the governor removed it. Okay, he did that and then we're back up. What happens though, we're at, we're full. ICU beds and 12 hospitals are full. We're full. Where do we go from here? Because um, like I said, we're, we haven't even really had Thanksgiving hit yet. Then Christmas is coming. I mean, are we talking about, do we put facilities out in the parking lot? Or, I mean, where are we going in the next two or three months to be able to get through this next surge? That is an excellent question. Uh, one for which there is not an easy answer. Where do we go from here? Um, you can build extra hospitals. You can build field hospitals. You can do it all day long, but the human resource is the most precious one. And, and we have a finite number of doctors and nurses and respiratory therapists, and I don't wanna miss anybody, all of our wonderful healthcare professionals, but they are a finite resource. So you look at the things that have worked as much as we hate to postpone elective procedures, it works and it frees up bed capacity quickly. So Dr. Dobbs and Dr. Byers called on physicians about six weeks ago to really start ramping up their performance of those type procedures in anticipation of a request to start self-moderating. And, and they did, the doctors have been trying to pay attention to, okay, we're not gonna do as many elective procedures to keep bed space available. The hospitals have done a very good job of auto-regulation up until this point. But if the dam starts to break, and I think that's what we're, we're seeing, right? We're seeing healthcare workers at home, we're seeing um, full hospitals, we're transferring out of state in some capacity, some situations, then that's, that's, where, that's why you have a state health officer. I mean, that's why you have public health laws because if you sit around and rely on all of us to collectively figure out how we're gonna do this, this problem just ex exponentiates. So I would anticipate the governor and the state health officer working very closely, uh, making probably some unique management decisions over the coming weeks. It's, it's, it's gonna have to happen. Our leaders are gonna have to lead us through this and I would ask the public to embrace some of that. These are not easy decisions. Our, our physicians practices many uh, nearly folded back during the yeah. shutdown before, just like other small businesses. And um, our physicians continue to be um, under strain, the hospitals and so on. So these decisions are not made lightly, but I, I will expect that there'll be some, some further recommendations. Holiday breaks with school will help some because the virus really doesn't care. I mean, a crowd is a crowd. Right. This is going to spread. So, so the more that we will do small groups, um, the more that we will listen. We we can we can interrupt a lot of the transmission. We know it works. We know mask work. So I think you'll see more encouragement from our elected officials. You'll see more encouragement from the health department to do the things we know work. 
and and the recurring theme is they ask you, they ask you, they ask you, and then they do it. That, right. That's what I've seen anyway. Yeah, I mean, and you've got a long history of working with them on different uh, health issues and so forth. So uh, you know about what you're talking about on this one. All right, we're coming up on, I know you've got a busy schedule. I don't want to keep you too long. The press releases, and I know they haven't been peer reviewed yet, but the press releases on the information on the two vaccines, and now I guess the, the one from England too, have all been very more than encouraging. They've been like incredible. So right. what what is your take on the vaccines? Do you feel like that that is going to be a total game changer once that gets online? I absolutely do. And and though, you know, the peer review process is ongoing, we're all very connected in these scientific circles and our colleagues nationally um, that are um, on, on ACIP and AMA and all these physicians that we're talking to, our public health colleagues all have looked at the science and it's really sound. I mean, all we're getting is wonderful promising reports from independent reviewers. And, and Dr. Dobbs also um, is, is very confident in the vaccine when he speaks about it. Uh, I am as well. So I can't wait to get mine. And, um, and, and I'll be honest, when all the, the politicking started, um, I, I didn't know that I would be this confident at this point in the game. And if I wasn't confident, I wouldn't say that I was confident. I would sit here and tell you I've got a problem. And I don't. I mean, I, I've talked to enough people that the science is there. You know, we're not at the final process yet, but we're anticipating wonderful news and being able to get this vaccine to our healthcare workers later on this month. And, and I'm confident in that process. So I think we've got, we've got good days ahead, but we've got some horrific ones to get through before we get there. And so now's the time to protect your family. If it's not your livelihood, stay home when you can. If you do not have to get out, please do not get out. Please take this virus seriously and let's, uh, let's make it to the other side of this as whole as we possibly can be. I, I think probably a great way to sum up this is it was the best of times, it was the worst of times. You know, I mean, you think about that vaccine. I mean, you're talking a scientific achievement on the level of the moon landing. To it's be able amazing. To you know, because it usually takes four years to produce a vaccine and we've done it in a year. I mean, thankfully, a lot of this research was built off of the first SARS virus that hit back, gosh, in the early 2000s. But still, to be able to get this out there, and I, and I agree with you, I mean, I, I would be the last person in the world to want to get a shot that if it was something that was built by the government on low bid, you know. Right, right, yeah, absolutely. I don't, I don't want to yeah. tail, you know, I don't want something like no. that to happen. No, it's an Every, incredible achievement, an incredible achievement. Definitely. And, uh, and of course, and now we got the logistics of getting it out there, too. And I, I know you'll be wrapped up in that, too. You'll have your special freezer set up and ready to give shots. Yeah, we've already been talking about it and planning. Doctors have been meeting with the health department. They've been wonderful purveyors of information. So we're excited about um, about getting that out to the people. And I wanted to, to end with you on um, one plea for our, our psychological health. You know, these are hard yes. times. And I, I mentioned adaptability and I'll mention it again. Look for the joy right now, not the reality we wish was happening, the reality that is happening. Clinging to normal, 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 normal is going to lead to disappointment over the next few weeks. So how we innovate and how we figure out to be a little different and to get through um, smaller is okay right now you know invest in your family invest in the things that are important it's going to come back to you psychologically to help you get through a crisis it's going to come back to you by protecting your neighbor protecting your family it's 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 a it's a time just to think differently you know we've made new traditions with um, trying to cook old family recipes or making christmas ornaments or or whatever it is that um, makes your family happy look for those things and it's going to carry you through that's a perfect way to end. And thank you so much. I hope the holiday seasons are good to you. And I appreciate you taking the time with me today. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate you and all that you do for Mississippi um, as well. So thanks again. Thank you so much, Dr. Jennifer Bryan. Thank you. Take care.